Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome this morning to our online service of worship. This morning I am in the very cool church of St Clement's in Fiskerton. It's been a warm week so it's lovely to escape into some peace and some coolness. Hope that you've had a good week wherever you are and whatever you have been up to. As we come this morning, we're going to be thinking about the welcome of God. Before we begin our time with our first song of worship, shall we pray with the collect for this week? God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast to your promises of peace, won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you. Genesis chapter 21 verses 8 to 21 entitled Hagar and Ishmael sent away the child grew and was weaned and on the day Isaac was weaned Abraham held a great feast but Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking she said to Abraham get rid of that safe slave woman and her son For that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah says to you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away. 
for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. As she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up, take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Luke chapter 14 and beginning at verse 12. Jesus said also to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours, in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the right resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. 
and the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes, and compel people to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So shall we pray? Living God, we thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray that as we explore what we've heard, we might gain a fresh understanding of your love for each of us. Amen. Well, today's gospel reading is a lesson about grace. Jesus uses the setting of his own presence at a dinner party to teach the Pharisees and those who were with him about the welcome of God. Jesus had been invited for a Sabbath dinner at the home of a leading Pharisee. The house is filled with important guests, all of whom are experts on the law. It wasn't so much a dinner of friends, but more a dinner of those who it looked good if you were giving dinner to. But Jesus challenges his hosts. Invite those who can't repay you, he says, for then you have an opportunity to receive a reward from God. Just inviting those of the same or higher social standing is its own reward. But you have an opportunity to receive a blessing from God, he tells his hosts, so don't blow it. As if to try and lessen the sting, Jesus shares a parable to make his point, and we hear the story of a great banquet, but to whom the guests are reluctant to go. While it may seem strange in light of our kind of practices in the 21st century, in the first century world, the invitation was of two parts. The initial invitation came some time ahead and then the actual summons to the meal was when it was ready. Sort of a save the date card and then a phone call to say the oven's on, come on round. So as you can imagine, not to come to a banquet which you'd previously indicated that you would be at was a grave breach of social etiquette and it was an insult to the host. So what reasons do the guests give as to that they can't come? Well, the first one we hear has just bought a field and must go and inspect it. But surely no one buys a field without seeing it first. The second says that they just bought five pairs of oxen and must try them out. But again, surely you don't buy oxen without testing them first. These two excuses are quite flimsy on the surface. It's clear that for these guests, money is of more importance. The third excuse that the guest uses is that they've just been married, but also, isn't that rather weak? When he accepted the invitation, surely he would have known of his wedding plans. That would have been the time to politely decline. But to back out at the last minute like this is definitely an act of rudeness. You can't blame the host, I don't think, for being angry when he hears of this rude affront and unanimous rejection by his peers. He is livid. So he tells his servants to do what would have been social suicide at the time had he not already been rejected, which is to invite the lower classes. But now it's an act that says... I'll show them. The host will not have an empty feast at his house. He will have guests. And the list of guests to be invited is identical to the list that Jesus has suggested in verse 13 to his Pharisees' hosts, those who could not repay them by inviting in return, the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Inside the town would be the poor, the beggars and the indignant, but outside the town would be the vagabonds, those who were shunned and unwelcomed inside. Such people would no doubt have felt very uncomfortable at the feast of a rich man, socially very out of place. But he has instructed his servants not to take no for an answer, 
They are to encourage and strongly urge everyone they meet to come and accept this invitation. It's been suggested that the host in this parable resembles God and his invitation to humankind to come home. So as I was reflecting on this passage for today, I was struck by three simple things that it reveals about the character of God. Firstly, God's grace. Grace is when we get what we don't deserve. In the parable, those who are not worthy to come to the host's table are shown mercy and grace. The poor, the lame, the crippled, the blind are now invited. In reality, that is you and that is me. We are unworthy to eat at God's table, but we've been invited and cleansed. This is God's grace in action, pure and simple. When we come home to God, we can be forgiven. We can be set free from the things that bind us up and we can sit at his table. Secondly, it speaks to me of God's persistence. When the original guests declined because of money or responsibilities or relationships, the others are now sought out. They're not just invited, but they're sought out and urged, compelled to accept the invitation. The poor and oppressed among the Jewish people, but also the Gentiles. The master is determined to host this party, to offer hospitality. He's persistent. When we think about God, about our Heavenly Father, he too is persistent. The whole narrative of the Bible is the account of God chasing his children, longing for reconciliation and restoration. We have that image of the father running to meet the prodigal son, arms open wide. And on the cross again, we see God in the form of Jesus, arms open wide, longing for us to come home. God is persistent. And finally, God's welcome. The host didn't put away the good food and get out the lesser things when his original guests bailed on him. The extravagant food and the rich wine, the decoration and service, the lavish welcome was offered to all of the guests, regardless of their status and background. God wants to welcome us all, all of us to his table. And that's the point. It's his table. I saw a brilliant tweet the other day on Twitter that tried to capture that inclusivity and welcome of God. It simply said this, it's not your body or your blood. It's not your table. It's not your church. It's not your invitation. You are the servant. You are not the master. You don't assemble the guest list. You were appointed an ambassador of the good news, not a bouncer at the door of Club Heaven. I love that. This parable today reminds us of God's grace, his persistence and his welcome, not just for us, but for all. Amen. So shall we pray? Lord God, we thank you for your grace, for your persistence which seeks us out, and for your welcome that accepts us just as we are. This week, would you help us to share that welcome with those we come into contact with, that they too might know your love and your grace. Amen. <laughs>
So shall we pray? God of grace, we thank you for the invitation you offer us all to come home. Thank you that you desire to be known to us and for us to bring our lives to you. Would you hear our prayers this morning as we come to pray for the world, our communities and ourselves? Creator God, we pray for people in parts of the world where life is precarious, through disaster, poverty, disease or war. We pray for the peace of God, which passes all understanding, to flood our world. We pray for the many issues of injustice that we see, for those people who are oppressed and marginalised. Loving God, would they find hope and come to know you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, we pray for the church, both here and throughout the world. We pray for all who call themselves Christians. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to grow in unity and strength. Help us to respect the beliefs of others, even if we do not share them. To celebrate all that we have in common and to accept our differences. May we be people who mirror your welcoming heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray today for our friends, our families and our Christian community, that united by our belief and our love of you, we may always welcome the newcomer, the stranger and all who are vulnerable. Help us always to follow Jesus' words and advice on hospitality, to live generous lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for all who are suffering today in body, mind or spirit, and we pray for those who care for them. We pray for the sick, for those who mourn, for those who need to find hope, love and faith. And in a moment of stillness, we name in our hearts those known to us in need of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we remember before you those who have died and those who are bereaved by their passing. We give back to you, Lord, those whom you gave to us. We thank you that your Son taught us that life is eternal and that love cannot die. As they rest in your presence, may we find comfort and hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, in the week that lies before us, may we reflect your love in our families, our church and our community. Would you help us to walk in your grace, to be persistent in our sharing of your love and in doing so welcome everyone we meet so that they might encounter your love and come home. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
So thank you so much for being with us this morning. We will be back in person next week in Staten by Langworth and in Greetwell, and we will be back online as well. And can you believe next week is going to be July? I don't know where this year is going. Have a brilliant week, whatever you're up to. There's a few notices and things coming up at the end. So do check those out and it'll be good to see you soon. So a final blessing as we go. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you, those that you love and those that you pray for, this day and evermore. Amen.